Hello, and welcome to episode 158 of Pop Culturally Deprived, where each week we watch a movie I've never seen before, which is most of them, and talk about the good, the bad, and the yippee ki yay. This week we're going to be talking about Die Hard 4 and 5 on your Jesus podcast. Why are you laughing at that? <laughs> On your Jesus podcast, we are not, just for full disclosure, up top, we are not a Jesus podcast. <laughs> okay, but maybe we are the way Bruce Willis meant it. <laughs> May, yeah, absolutely. Damn, I'm in Jesus a tight spot. Jesus podcast. Damn, I'm in a tight spot. <laughs> My hair. <laughs> That was like last week's film. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was the same. It was totally yeah, the same. Totally. All right. I am Mandy Kay, and you can find me on Twitter at Mandy Kay. <laughs> I am Matthew Vose. You can find me on Twitter at Matthew Vose. Where you talk about putting Russian dubs of Buffy on things. Yes, so, yes, the Nightwatch episode will have been out because it's before this one. So we hope you all enjoyed that where I managed to get a clip of Star Wars and Harry Potter and Russian dubbed Buffy into an episode. Ooh. Yay me. Yay you. <laughs> uh, if you missed it, go back and check out Nightwatch, even if you've not seen it. Like, it's a great film, but it's. It, I think we had a very good conversation. Mandy's not heard it yet, so she's really worried I'm making it up. <laughs> No, I thought we had a really good conversation, so I, I'm assuming that your editing didn't turn it into a bad conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's going to be Everything's funny. half a second off, yeah. <laughs> uh, we would like to give a shout out to one of our wonderful patrons, Kate, who was on Twitter, at Katie Sheru, uh, has supported us, I think, from the very beginning of it, and has been on to talk to us. Kate is a wonderful, wonderful follower, supporter, friend of the podcast, so thank you very much, Kate. Thank you, Kate. All right, we're here to talk about Die Hard. Die Hard. We're talking about Die Hards. We are Dies Hard? About... <laughs> Dies Hard. Maybe. Dies Hard, like Surgeons General. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why you let me unilaterally make the decision to combine four and five into a single episode. Because I had seen four and didn't really want to talk about it, to be <laughs> honest. And I hadn't seen five. Okay. And didn't really want to talk about it. Okay, fair enough. Joseph so, also had only had seen four and had not yet seen five, so apparently that's a trend. Is he just looking at my letterbox list and just making sure he watches all the same? We are so in sync sometimes. <laughs> no, but he, I mean, the this, the fourth one, um, Live for Your Die Hard, is his favorite of the franchise. So oh, really? definitely differs from you on that one. Oh. I'm very sorry for what's about to happen, Joseph. (laughs) I hope Mandy backs you up enough. Um, I will, don't worry. (laughs) Uh, So no, I thought this would be good that we could just rip the Band-Aid off. Band-Aid, is that the thing? Band-Aid, yes. Plaster. (laughs) For everyone else. Uh, Very quickly, cover them both, talk about them, uh, talk about... Why they're different? Does it work as a franchise? Take a, you know, slightly larger look at the whole thing. Okay, that's fair. Mm. Starting off with a film that is called Different Things for You than it is for me. It is. Yes. Um, It was called Live Free or Die Hard here in the States, but Mm -hmm. apparently it was Die Hard 4.0 everywhere else. Die Hard 4.0 because it's about computers and stuff. So Mm. 4.0 makes it all computery. Mmm... No, it's Love Free or Die Hard. I mean, it that name doesn't really make sense either, so whatever. So, do you want to try to tell us what to die... I mean, it doesn't matter. I am still going to do it. Yeah, but the story <laughs> is just such the... Ugh. Go on. All right. Clearly, Matthew is holding nothing close to his chest on this one. <laughs> he is not excited about this conversation at all. Okay. I should have waited to open my beer now, shouldn't I? Yes. Right, let's yes. get into it. <laughs> it's ginger beer, but, you know, can still do the same thing. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, Live Free or Die Hard, or Die Hard 4.0. Die Hard 4.0. Uh, John McClane and a young hacker join forces to take down master cyber terrorist Thomas Gabriel in Washington, D.C. Yeah. Okay. A Good Day to Die Hard. What was that called? And Was it? 
called that, or was it, it Die it's Hard? It's called A Good Day to Die Hard. It is called A Good Day. So it was just the fourth one that they changed. Yeah. Okay. And A Good Day to Die Hard, John McClane is a terrible father who knows nothing about his son's life. They end up in Russia, where ultimately they team up to stop the bad guys, but they wouldn't have had to in the first place if John McClane wasn't an idiot. Which now one of those do you think I wrote? <laughs> yeah, that's you <laughs> sticking the boot in. <laughs> Let's loop back around to that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> die Hard 4.0, or Live Free or Die Hard, is the fourth installment of the Die Hard franchise. Released in 2007, it was directed by Lynn Wiseman and starred Bruce Willis, Justin Long, Timothy Oliphant, and Maggie Q. It is the highest grossing film of the Die Hard series and received generally positive reviews from critics. Die Hard 5, or A Good Day to Die Hard, is the fifth and final, so far, installment of the series. Released in 2013, it was directed by John Moore, written by Skip Woods, and stars Bruce Willis, Jay Courtney, and Sebastian Koch. It was the first Die Hard film to be released in IMAX theaters. And while it was a box office success, it received overwhelmingly negative reviews and has an approval rating of only 15% on Rotten Tomatoes. It baffles me, the good reception for four. I loved four. Utterly baffles me. Two th- oh, God. Ugh. Anyway. <laughs> All right, Matthew. So how did you watch these two films? It sounds like you don't own them. <laughs> I do not own them. I have uh, the Die Hard trilogy box set. Okay. Which is the first three films. It has. It came with a cell from one of the films. A little mm-hmm. um, frame of, of one of them. It's a whole nice, nice collector's edition before these distant sequels came out. Uh, I recorded one from Channel 4 in December 2018, and I just recorded one from Film 4 in January 2019. Wait, you've been holding on to these for a year? Yep. Wow. <laughs> that is dedication. Because at some point we were going to do it, yeah. So they've just been sat on the DVR on the Skybox uh, waiting to be watched. Oh, Matthew. And now I can find... I did have to sit there scrolling down, like, they're in here somewhere, they're in here somewhere. <laughs> How much space do you have on your DVR? Oh, terabytes. Okay. Wow. And it can it can do like five channels at once recording or four channels oh. and you can watch one or something. That's so fancy. Like, they are they are pretty nice things. Okay. This episode sponsored by SkyQ. <laughs> <laughs> to be clear, we... it's really not. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Pay us Sky. <laughs> You've got enough money. <laughs> uh how we hope to watch it in the US. Um, I did the free trial of the Stars add-on on Hulu. Okay. So you can watch it there or you can rent it, any of the digital rental services. It's available. They're both mm. available. They are on Amazon Prime and Vudu okay, and okay. Google Play and iTunes. Yes, yeah, they, they were rentable over here. The Stars channel over here, whatever sh- film that I used for it over here, I think that was when I watched Whip It. Do you have access to Whip It on Stars? Um, I don't know. Because... Let's cancel talking about Die Hard and just watch that. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, No. Ah, boo. Okay. Right. Carry on with the Die Hards. Die's hard. All right. This hard. (laughs) Well, it's your turn to talk. You're supposed to start asking some questions. Yeah, I am, aren't I? Let's not. We've talked about Bruce Willis several times. There's not really anyone hugely famous introduced into the in these. I think the directors are not famous. It's you know. They're based off newspaper articles, I think. So, did you enjoy Die Hard 4.0 and A Good Day to Die Hard? I loved Die Hard 4.0. Like, I think it's my favorite of the whole franchise. I hated 5. Like, 5 is just a bad movie. Three years in and you've learned nothing. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks, Matthew. We are allowed to have differences of opinion. Yes, and then you realise I'm right after an hour of talking about it. Oh my god. Oh my god. Okay, go on then. Um, Let's do a little bit of of each of them. Do you want to talk about why you liked four, or do you want to talk about why you didn't like five? Or is it a conversation that involves them both? No, they're two separate, absolutely two separate movies. Like, they have nothing in common with each other. That is very true. Die Hard 4, I really enjoyed, I think, because it's the most recently relatable. Like, it it exists in a world that makes sense to me. Okay. Because okay. it's in the 2000s, right? Mm-hmm. It's not from the 80s or super early 90s, so it's not a world in my distant past that I've kind mm-hmm. of only read about or seen in the movies. It's a world that is relatable. Right. 
And the plot was interesting to me. Mm -hmm. It wasn't predictable. I spent the whole movie trying to figure out what the end game was for the bad guys. Desperately hoping that it wasn't just about the money, but it's always Mm -hmm. just about the money. Yep. I love Justin Long. He's adorable. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, okay. I've always liked Justin Long. Ah. And I thought Bruce Willis... In that movie, he portrayed an accurate representation of what I would expect his character to have grown into over the course of 15, 20 years. Okay. He was unflappable. He was mostly mature. He did what needed to get done. He had some of those mini rants to himself that are great, but he was there to take care of the kid, and he did. Okay. And I enjoyed that. Right. Yep. And then we got to number five. Okay. John McClane is a fucking terrible father in number five, which <laughs> does not line up with the rest of the movies. No. What? So why? Why? Why are you saying that? Okay. Where do I start? <laughs> he he doesn't know that his son is a CIA agent. He doesn't know that his son is in Russia. He doesn't. Which okay, fine. His son is undercover. So it makes sense that he wouldn't know where his kid is. But Mm. it's so bad that he thinks so badly of his kid, who is clearly an upstanding person if he's an undercover CIA CIA agent, that he thinks that he's legitimately in Russia arrested and he has to go there to save him. Doesn't give him the benefit of the doubt for anything. Within five minutes of being there ruins a three-year op. And then after that happens and after he realizes it's happened, he continually talks down to his kid, is sarcastic, is rude. Like nothing good happened between these two. Okay. In the entire course of the movie. Okay. It was terrible. Yeah. Can I give my impressions of them? Because I mean, I'm new to number five as well. Okay. And I will say, for me, part of, I said this on Twitter, part of why I liked Five might be watching it so close to Four. And because I really didn't like Four. Okay. And so it might be going like, oh, okay. I mean, this is still kind of trash. It's just still not as good as any, it's not even as good as Die Hard 2. So, you know. Um, but that might be why I preferred it. Hmm. Like, if I watched Die Hard 5 on its own, I might have gone like, oh, yeah, this is rough. But, like, feeling like it was coming back a little bit to what the, the core tenets of what make Die Hard good for me. Although not entirely. I think there was a thing in here that, like, number four is a distant sequel. In the vein of, and I know you won't have seen some of these, but things like Blade Runner 2041. I've, yeah, no, about. I've seen that. 2049. Okay. Yes, sorry. Um, it, you know this thing of, like, releasing sequels much mm-hmm. later. So it's like... 11 years, 11 plus years between three and four. Mm-hmm. So they're kind of, oh, yes, let's let's revamp this franchise and bring it out in a new way. So they're trying to do what does a classic action franchise like Die Hard look like in a modern action world? Because at this point, too, so 2007, Mission Impossible is becoming a thing. Fast and the Furious is becoming a proper thing. So, you know, if we're talking big action franchises, Batman Begins has come out. Um, We're about to have Dark Knight and Iron Man. So, like, it's becoming the world of superhero movies, really fast action, really powerful um, action sequences and characters, even in things like The Fast and Furious and Mission Impossible. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to incorporate some of that into Die Hard, which is about, like, just a dude who is fallible and gets cut and gets shot at and and wounded throughout, but still survives no matter what. Okay. Okay. I think that's what they're trying to incorporate here. Number five is still six years on, but that's about the sort of normal thing for a diehard or a big action thing. Mm -hmm. That's okay. And I think they're trying to hand the torch over. I think they are trying to set up Jai Courtney as the new John McClane. Oh, I know. I absolutely agree with you there. Like it felt like they are setting something up for there to Mm. be a new John McClane. Right. John McClane Jr., Jack, whatever he wants to go by. I did. I absolutely got that feeling. But... Mm -hmm. They assassinated John McClane as a character in this movie. Mm. 100%. The John McClane. Now, I did have a comment in my notes up front. I said something like, I don't particularly like this version of John McClane, but he's not really that off brand. 
But that was in like the first 10 minutes of the movie. And then it just (laughs) didn't stop. And so I feel like the guy from four who did everything in his power to save his daughter, to save Justin Long's character, to keep them safe when he had Mm -hmm. them, is the same guy who's getting ready to get his son killed. And while in the middle of these firefights is degrading his son, putting his son down, spy shit. Right. This is what you've been doing with your life, spy (laughs) shit. That should have been a moment of, oh, my God, I'm sorry I ruined your op. This is wonderful that you've actually made something with your life when I thought you were selling drugs. Okay. Yeah, and yeah, instead, yeah. we get derisive laughter and spy shit. Now, okay, so I'm going to skip over my thought on four. We're going to come back to it. Five, I think there is a heap of toxic masculinity going on in this film. And, and some of that is there in all the diehards. The fact he's too proud to phone his wife back, so that's why they're ending up getting divorced. Mm, yeah. um, he can only tell Al about, like, if I, you know, if I don't make it out, tell Holly I love her and I tried to save her and stuff, like, when he thinks right. he's going to die. You know, that that kind of thing. That the, the only time he can actually go to emotion, and we see it in this as well, the only time he can actually really try to be good to his son is when they think they're about to run into a suicidal building thing mm-hmm. and be, like, burned alive by the radiation or something. So... I mean, it's not good. It's not good to have such stuff on screen. But I think they are holding up the bits of the character there. The bit that I think is lost in both of them, there is a a vague hint of it in Five, is the thing that John McClane's not actually dumb. He's streetwise, but he's also very sharp. We see in, in One, Two, and Three... Him sort of working the problem a bit and thinking through, wait, they're they're doing that, they're they're doing that. Why are they doing that? Uh, and sort of using his kind of detective skills, mm-hmm. detective qualities. Yes. It, he is he is a blunt tool at times. He is shoot the guys, run around the corner, shoot more guys. Mm-hmm. I think four basically sets him up as he's only that. He's not trying to figure out the problem. It's Justin Long and other characters who are trying to figure out the problem. Whereas what we've seen from John McClane is him going, hang on. No, 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 we're going to stop with this riddle malarkey that Jeremy Irons is sending us off on. Let's go back because I know that they're robbing City Hall or the, the banks. And and that is kind of the best bit about it is, you know, he is just slowly working it out through using the clues and cues that he gets. There was a moment in Five where he said, like when the, is it Yuri? Yuri. Yuri's daughter is there and he's like, this does not feel right. This is not. Uh, and, and he knows there's something about to go on and happen, mm-hmm. but they never take that further. They never explore it. They never have like the son learning to trust the, the father's instincts. Right. It, it is still about setting up the son as he. This is his element. He's the one who's figuring it out and working out what's going on. Mm-hmm. So that's a shame. That for me is the bit of Die Hard that's lost because they've turned it into an action series. Okay. He's just running forward and doing the thing. A bit um, Ethan Hunt esque from Mission Impossible. I, I think that's almost the most direct comparison. Ethan Hunt figures out the next step he needs to go and do and goes and does a flying from the building, jumping out of an airplane, and s- swinging down a shaft thing. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I, I I feel that more about five than I do four. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. I, I, I very much like the John McClane that we got in four. I felt him being... <sighs> I mean, like I said, he's. He, I feel like he grew into the character that I expected him to in okay. four. I feel like they presented us with a John McClane who is older, wiser, calmer in many ways. Okay. Um, I, I think I use the word unflappable a little bit. Like he just, he sees the shit happening. He knows, great, I got to take care of it. I'm going to take care mm-hmm. of it. He still had some of his quippy one-liners. It, it, it just, that one felt like, the Die Hard franchise in the modern world. And I think right. that's why right. I liked it so much. Mm. And then we get to five and exactly what you're saying, he's like the dumb brute force. Yeah. And, and I think he uses that to try to save his son. You think of the bit where like the massive truck is pushing his son's van to the side and he gets the four by four so he can shunt it and try and save his son. Mm hmm. And take the thing out. Like, he is doing everything in his power to work and save his son. I I think, but but like you say, they're using the sort of action side of him rather than anything else to get there. Right. I think in four, the bit that stands out for me is where they go and 
he's having to sneak around the building, taking people out and shooting people on stairs. And then eventually he gets into a fight with Maggie Q and he's telling Justin Long, like, continue doing, continue what you're doing. And then he gets a van and runs her over and then runs her down an elevator shaft. And she's still alive. So there's a whole thing on like a dangling car and stuff. Like, why did he not break? Let her fall off and then run her over again. It just... It's action for action's sake, and he's there doing the dumb brute force thing rather than mm-hmm. actually being involved in the plot. It's such, and and some of the phrases he uses about her, I'm not totally sure I'm happy with. Right, right. No, I get that. The the other side of four, just going back to the, to, to my thoughts on it, and, and this is probably what annoys me is it's constantly putting down and being snarky about geeky computer people. And I take that a little bit personally, if I'm honest. Okay, that <laughs> that is a fair point. I, I take it, but no, I don't take it. I, I, I find it ridiculous when you have jokes about, like, him snapping a thing or not understanding what something is. And, oh, you're, you play with dolls or oh, with their action figures and this kind of thing. It's 2007 by this point. Like, superheroes are a thing. Star Wars is a thing, you know. Yeah, but that was a really funny line. I People prefer Star Wars this. myself. <laughs> that was <laughs> that, funny. That was, yeah. But <laughs> I think they just want it to... Uh, like, it feels like they are guys writing a script about nerds and geeks without knowing how to write about them. They're writing the stereotype of guys in their mum's basements. Literally. And, with... and for it to be exactly massive fat guys in their mum's basements isn't mm-hmm. that funny. <laughs> um... <laughs> That was the best laugh I could conjure for it. <laughs> the thing that... I, I, and it was Catherine who called this out. It's kind of like guys who are frustrated at computers taking over the world and they can't keep up with it. The South Park thing of, like, they took her gerbs! They took her gerbs! Like, and that's what they're... They took our jobs. No, I got follow. that, but I don't <laughs> get the reference, so... It, very funny thing in South Park. I'll take your word um, for it. Are there fun, very funny things in South Park? There are many funny things mm. in South Park. <laughs> I don't think I believe you. <laughs> oh, we could do a South Park watch. The best old South Park. Or we could not. <laughs> <laughs> it just, it feels like it's written by guys who want to mock the culture I live in and the world I live in without actually understanding it. And it it comes off false on both sides. It, it feels like it's bad because I want to condescend against the people who are condescending against Mm -hmm. people like me. And I feel it's bad against people like me because it's written so badly. And it's not realistic. So can I share with you why this is Joseph's favorite out of the franchise? Mm -hmm. So Joseph works in IT. He is a computer guy. Like, and and Mm -hmm. so he, he said, you know, I was asking about it and I was like, is it just because it was hacker stuff? Like, is that why this one was your favorite? And initially he said yes, but then he thought about it a little bit more and he said, in his worldview, the plot of this being something that could legitimately happen in the world, like a fire sale is a real thing. Mm -hmm. It's a real potential threat. Um, In his world, this is the one of the, the four that he had seen before. This is the one that makes sense to him. Okay. Because it's realistic. As a threat, as a potential threat. Um, It's more realistic than somebody, you know, robbing the Federal Reserve or the vault in the the tower, right? Okay. Um, And so he felt – I don't think he felt like it was condescension, but we also didn't get in the specifics of how people were portrayed. It was specifically Mm -hmm. the plot, like the threat, the bad guys. I'll tell you where it loses me, okay? Okay. Right at the beginning – (laughs) <laughs> where, oh, okay <laughs> like there's the whole thing of maggie q who was in a mission impossible just before this um maggie q like getting all the code and the information from these guys and then sending a virus signal that when they send a command to their computers will blow up their computers okay yeah okay and what this virus appears to do is mean that when they hit and it's it's shown to be the delete key so i don't know right. if it's any key if it's just like any time they stop the screen save from happening or something by pressing the space bar it would happen but it's shown to be the delete key when they press the delete key that sends a signal to some c4 that has been put under their computer under in their basement houses mm-hmm. that explodes 
Okay. And at the same time, they've got guys with guns watching these people houses in case it doesn't work so they can kill them anyway. Yes. Are they saying the delete key sends like a Bluetooth signal to this thing? Are they saying it's actually a trigger? Like there's a switch underneath the delete key that sends the, the physical signal? And, and why are the people sat outside and not just sat there with a button go, that goes like, oh, send the signal now. Okay, click. Why are they leaving it so much a chance that, was it a Robocop doll? A Terminator doll. That was it. The Terminator doll falls on his keyboard and presses the delete key and that's what saves him because the thing blows up. It makes no sense. It's just the most ridiculous sort of um, thingy machine set up to try to kill someone that when they hit the delete key, because we've sent them this virus that will then turn that... It's it's it just it's it's ridiculous. <laughs> okay, I think you have a valid point about why why did it have to be triggered to their computer when they had people outside who could just use a detonator. <laughs> I think that's a valid point, and I didn't think of that. Um, coming from somebody who's not quite as techy when it comes to programming and viruses, the idea of just pressing a button and having that trigger like a bit of code that would then flip the switch that worked for me i could buy it okay, okay why it was the delete key i thought that was a little bit weird because how often do people press that key mm-hmm. like it, especially when you're getting right like you're turning something off yeah because there was a thing like oh my computer's done something weird i don't hit the delete key i hit escape right exactly and then i hit power or it just so or I think control it's, it's, alt delete <laughs> exactly it's like it's that kind of so early on it's doing stuff that's making me go wait what yeah and i can i can see the point you're making like yeah it is doing something interesting with us and and this is based on a newspaper article i think that was written about this thing might happen Mm -hmm. so so they basically took that as an idea and then went right let's write a film based on it and then i think went hey what if we put made this a diehard film which I think has happened on every Die Hard film. <laughs> yeah. It's like it started as another property. And, and I wonder if they are at this stage basically saying like, okay, this property is going to cost us, because it's a big action film or big whatever it is, and it's going to cost us $50 million to make. And it's going to make us $100 because it's an unknown thing. But if we make it a Die Hard, it'll make us $300 million. Mm. Something yeah. like that. And, and I feel like both 4 and 5 have that in common. Mm-hmm. That they were at some point just written as interesting spy action films. And then they went, but what if we made it a Die Hard and trade on the brand and the actor? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that's how a lot of movies get made. Yeah? It's, it's trading on the name of the actor. Oh, yeah, yeah. Actors are the, like the number one thing the yeah. audience will go and see. So, hmm. Okay. I did think the special effects in 4 were pretty spectacular. They were miles above anything we'd seen previously. I'm trying to remember any particular spot. The, the, I think a lot of it feels like practical effects. I, they're pretty sure they weren't. Mm. But things like the helicopter chase. Okay. So th- th- there's two that I can think of specifically. Mm. One, oh. the car flip in the tunnel. Mm-hmm. And then there was one where he flipped. He was he was driving a car. They're all car related. So maybe they are practical effects. But he drove into a chain link fence that flipped over with the bad guy on it. Mm-hmm. Both of those I thought were really well done. Okay, nice. So that's a I can't, I can't something remember. in the I, plus column for this movie. Yeah, it's standing out because there are a lot of sort of CG effects in five. Yeah, I don't think are necessarily as good as certainly because because I mean when when did that come out? Twenty twelve, twenty thirteen. Twenty thirteen. So we're in a post Avengers world. Yeah, and Avengers has some good effects. You know, the, yeah, look. five did not. Yeah, five has some. I think good effects, but they still look a bit like CG. They're not quite polished enough. I think they're going for the grand scale well. And I think in 4, there's just, there's so much of it. Like, as I'm thinking about, and I remember watching this thinking like, wow, we're off to the races already. You know, this film is going. Mm -hmm. And it didn't seem to take a breather for a really long time. Right, right. Whereas 5 felt like it took a very long time to get going and then just started running. Fair enough. Mm. I just I keep thinking of the, the helicopter crash at the end of five just was terrible, yeah. both the visually and the sound effects on it were awful. The weird it's it's going into a building in slow motion as they're jumping out of the building in slow motion mm-hmm. and it's just uh... and the sound sounded like somebody was dropping buttons in a jar. 
it was all this little plink, 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 plink. And I was like, that is not what that would sound like. It was terrible. (laughs) Dope. Before we transition into some of my favorite moments, since I'm not sure Mm -hmm. you actually have any, Mm -hmm. I I thought of something that I thought was really clever and I just want to share it. Go on. So this particularly was a number four. How on earth did Justin Long and Bruce Willis's characters make it through all of those shenanigans? Yeah. Like, it was just one right after the other of these near-death experiences of, like, near misses of of Mm. death. One right after the other. And the only time I've ever seen that happen are the people in Final Destination. (laughs) They're the only people who ever miss death that that often. Like, (laughs) it just doesn't happen. And and maybe that's some of it for me from 4, because it was so nonstop. Like, the the great thing about the Die Hard films is it's him in a series of situations, just gradually getting through the bad guys, stopping the plot, figuring it out, doing whatever he can as he goes. Mm Mm-hmm. And this was just like, you know, he even makes quips about it, about like, you know, do you dull, you know, 1-800-henchmen and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> order more yeah. or something? Because it is just a sort of endless thing. Yeah. No, which, it was. It was just one right after the other mm. without letting up. I, I think in both of them, and this is for me what hurts both, is there's no sense, there's no fan service. So mm-hmm. th- there's no... Oh, hey, you're John McClane. Didn't you do that thing in that tower? Didn't you do that thing in New York? Didn't you do that thing at that airport? Right. Something right. like that. Uh, there's no... Like, even in Die Hard 2, where he phones Al and sends him a fax, it's like that little moment. There's nothing tying... And, and again, this goes back to, like, this is not a Die Hard film. But they've <laughs> not put anything in to make you go, oh, yeah, that's cool, because I've seen that film, and I know right. that, and I recognize that reference and stuff. Yeah. I think by this point, certainly by five, he's a national hero. You would think. He's got every medal, he's on talk shows, you know, someone's ghostwritten a book for him, all this kind of thing. Uh, but there's nothing, there's not like, you know, oh, John McClane, you're in Russia, yeah, let's let's take you, you know, bad things follow you, so we're going to make sure you're okay. Right. <laughs> yeah. I, I, fair I, enough. I think there's one or two moments, and, and in some ways that's what lets it down four as a, a distant sequel, and five as just a kind of franchise element. Mm-hmm. They could have done a passing the torch thing with like jack mclean making some of the same some of the exact same quips i think they tried it not sure it came off no no it didn't at all Mm. unless thinking about it as a franchise die hard 4 was the only one that was pg-13 and it was only reading the details about it that i noticed it i think they got the vibe of it right the kind of this is the level at which the action is pitched a bit of swearing, bit of explosions, bit of gunplay, and and some fisticuffs thrown in there, but not Deadpool levels of gore and violence, right, right. and not softening it too much to make it more acceptable to a wider audience. Did did you notice anything? No, that's not something I picked up on. Hmm. So I wonder. I, I wonder quite what was different about it to give it the the, uh, the lower rating. Because hmm. I didn't notice anything. The first thing that comes up when I Google it is somebody ranting about it when they found out it was going to be a Die Hard movie that was PG-13. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like there was less profanity. Yeah, there's a comment here of one use of strong language. So that's the thing. And, and I mean, you know me, I, I don't think it's necessary to use it all the time so that when it is used, it has more impact. So. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, so Willis even said that he thought viewers who are unaware that it was not R-rated would not suspect it because the level and intensity of the action, as well as the usage of some profanity, still made it feel like a Die Hard movie. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I think it actually fits in with the vibe very well. Um, perhaps some of that is because of films like Die Hard. Further films got more violent, more action heavy, and it became more palatable and acceptable to people. Yeah. Mm. Um, Bruce Willis also said that he thought Die Hard 4 was the best of the franchise at the time that it came out. He said it was better than the first one. So when he was promoting his new film, he said it was really (laughs) good. Is that what you're telling me? Yes, 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 it is. (laughs) Right. Right, yep. Okay, cool, thanks. You're welcome. (laughs) All right. Did you have any favorite, any favorite moments at all from 4 or 5? I mean, not really. But, I mean, the phone stuff in 5 is pretty good. I I quite like him on the phone to his daughter as he's driving. I found that quite funny. 
And let's give a shout out to Mary, Mary Elizabeth Winstead, who I love. Seeing her in anything is awesome. So it's really cool to see her cropping up and like doing something fun and random. Okay. But I, yeah, I quite like the whole uh, him on the phone to her, putting the phone down as he's driving, doing an action scene, picking the phone up again. Um, and there's a couple more quips about the phone later on. And then there's the bit where his son, I think, smashes the phone. Or is this in yes. four? That the phone is smashed and he's like, hey, I had two years contract on that. Yeah, and that was in five. Right. I quite like that. That's quite a fun moment. Just like, ah, oh. like you say, the sort of quippiness and mm-hmm. just, you know, okay. going with the thing. But yeah, that's quite nice. What we've not talked about is Timothy Oliphant. Correct. I have a lot of time for Timothy Oliphant. I find him very charming. I find him very enjoyable to watch on screen. There was very recently a quote about him from a TV show that said, Timothy Oliphant is 50 gallons of man in a 10 gallon hat. So okay. thank you. Thank you. The good place for <laughs> talking about <laughs> Timothy Oliphant so often because it's so true. He is just such a presence on screen and he's cool and interesting. And, and I sort of bought the duplicity of the character and the plot. Mm hmm. And that he would have sold to his, you know, computery underlings that, yeah, yeah, this is going to be amazing. We're going to hack them. It's going to be cool. And then it turns out they're going to be shot because, I mean, we did watch that going, wait, they've seen him betray and shoot everyone else. Did they not know what was coming? But right. he's re- he's really charming. I'd follow him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about that, about the last guy, the the last guy who who walked out and was like, Oh, is it time? Yes. And yeah. he walked out and then they shot everybody else. And I was like, does that guy really think he's not going to get shot? Yeah. Like, I don't but, think, and they never showed that, I don't think, in the film because to everybody died in that movie. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah. But he, like, he has yeah. absolutely charismatic and I, I'm with you on that one. Yeah. He's, he's the best. I mean, he's not Alan Rickman. No. But he's not far off. It's just, there's nothing memorable about the character. His portrayal of it, still good. Mm. Mm. Speaking of Alan Rickman, kind of, did you notice that there was a moment where in five, Mm -hmm. Yuri fell off the building? Yeah. And they were trying to mimic Alan Rickman's fall off the tower? Yeah. It did not work for me. No. I I almost wish they'd done it with McLean, Mm. either when he jumps out at the end or when he jumps down the... Uh, shoot on the scaffolding yes like either one again, of those would have been better you know if that's the sort of fans uh, fan servicey fun you can do and like mm-hmm. oh look they're doing the, the alan rickman shot on bruce willis that's kind of cool yeah, yeah yeah but giving it to yuri who couldn't pull it off didn't work well no how about you i'm assuming <laughs> i have several from have four more. yeah okay i do okay um Justin, well, okay, so I loved everything about Justin Long's character, and it made me realize how old I am because I keep calling him a kid in this movie. Mm -hmm. He was 29. Yeah. I'm old. So talk to me about Justin Long. I don't know Justin Long very well. Um, We're not best buddies or anything. What what do you know him from? Why do you think of him as a kid? He's the PC guy from the I'm a Mac, I'm a PC commercials. Oh, is he with uh, John Hodgman? And he, have you ever seen the movie Accepted? No, I know of it. It's so good. He's the main character in that. Okay. Um, He dated Drew Barrymore for a while. He did? Did did he date Jennifer Aniston? I don't think so. Okay. Okay. Um, He's done a lot of other things where he's just that guy. Like, I just, I I think he's adorable. He was in Galaxy Quest. Well, yes. Yeah. Like, I've seen him in one or two things. Yeah. Yeah. But not much like he's in a series at the moment called Giri Hadji, and that was the thing we'd seen him in. Like, we've seen him recently and we can't remember what. Mm. Oh, yeah, the London Tokyo detective series. Justin Long's in it randomly. Mm. Okay. <laughs> Where else have I seen him? Oh, he was in Dodgeball? Yeah. So, that, But there's no one, like, role you particularly think of him, or, or is it accepted as your. Um, no, he's the the Mac guy. Okay. From the, the Apple commercials. Like, that's. Okay. Because he just did it for so long. Like, those were iconic hmm? over here in the States. I don't know if they oh, were. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, because um, obviously they were spoofed a lot. Yeah, yeah. In, in you know, Mimi culture. And then they did it over here with Mitchell and Webb. So it was two comedians that you see that, that do stuff together anyway. Mm-hmm. They did a show called Peep Show. And it was slightly weird because it was like, wait, but the PC guy is actually quite funny. 
<laughs> and the Mac guy often plays a bit of a douche. So right, yeah. <laughs> this doesn't quite work for us. Yeah. But they, they did also look like John Hodgman and Justin Long. So oh, okay. I suspect okay. that might have been the thing. Right. Um, I did misspeak. And initially, I said Justin Long was the PC, but he's the Mac guy. Yes. He's always the Mac guy. He was the yeah. cool, hip Mac guy. And the Windows guy was the nerdy one with the pocket protectors. Yeah. Yeah, because it was like it worked when it happened because that was when when the, they first launched them because Mac were doing the iMac, so suddenly you were getting mm-hmm. these all in one, colorful, interesting looking computers. Yeah, yeah. And PCs were boxes that had a blue screen of death. Yep. <laughs> For full disclosure, bench. I am a PC girl. I use yeah. Mac at work, but this is a PC. Oh, do you? You do. I yeah. did not know that. <laughs> I also really like Justin Long had this line about classic rock. He said, this okay. is like shoving a pine cone up my ass. <laughs> and I like just, that line? I love that line because he stood up for how he felt about that awful music. <laughs> you see, again, it feels like people writing, oh, kids don't appreciate classic rock, so they're not going to like, me and all my friends love classic rock. Led Zeppelin, Deep Purple, Rolling Stones, all, all you know, this kind of thing. Yeah, we're all over it. Well, it felt like he was making, trying to make a point, a distinction between just old rock and classic rock. Because he specified, this isn't classic rock, this is just old rock. And so it okay, felt like, fair. to me, there mm. were things that he liked, and this was just not the thing he enjoyed. And Things that should be left behind. Yes. Right. And he, okay, and he okay. was very clear with John <laughs> Clayne that this was painful for him. Right. Uh, Quibby line, uh, he, mm-hmm. Justin Long's, again, Justin Long's character, he says to uh, Bruce Willis, you just killed a helicopter with a car? And John McClane's response was, I was out of bullets. <laughs> Classic John McClane response. I loved it. Absolutely. that That is one of the moments of the franchise, to be fair. It is very, very good. And especially because the guy jumps out of the helicopter so he can interrogate him. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I will absolutely give that as a really good moment. Yeah, yeah. Well, and he even had one. I actually, I think this one was in four, too. Um Timothy Oliphant or Maggie Q, one of them said, I thought I killed you. And he said, I get that a lot. Yeah. Right. I mean, that that sums up John McClane mm-hmm. right there. Everybody's just always trying to kill him. Yeah. My favorite moment, though, was John's cool. speech to Justin. Was his name Matthew? In the I movie? think so. Although it's another case. Of, let's talk about Matthew Rolls in a minute. Yes. <laughs> so John gave him a speech about not being a hero, about not wanting to be a hero. You know what you get for being a hero? Nothing. Get shot at. Get a little pat on the back, blah, blah, blah. Atta boy. Get divorced. My wife can't remember your last name. Kids don't want to talk to you. You have to eat a lot of meals by yourself. Trust me, kid, nobody wants to be that guy. Then why are you doing this? Because there's nobody else to do it right now, that's why. Believe me, if there was somebody else to do it, I would let them do it, but there's not. So we're doing it. That's what makes you that guy. And they close out the movie with John McClane saying to Justin Long's character, that's what makes you that guy. Right. And I really, really enjoyed that. And I felt like that was one of the most on-brand things for John McClane to say. Like, after everything that he's gone through, he's saying he's not doing it to be a hero. He's not doing it for accolades. He's doing it because it needs to be done and nobody else is going to do it. Right. And I love that. Yes, I really, I like the sentiment of it. You do the job that's in front of you. Mm-hmm. And and nothing else matters. You get it done. Do you believe he gets nothing for all the stuff he's done? Do you believe he is still uh, an NYPD detective? Yes, he was still an NYPD detective. Well, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> do you mean should he be? Do, you, yeah, do I believe is, is that I, what would have happened? Yeah, I'm not sure I buy it. I'm not sure I, I don't buy that people are like, hey, it's that I dude do. who was in those three different like massive catastrophes. But were they really massive catastrophes, though? I mean, they were very localized. It was one building in one city that the cops never even heard all of the shooting, right? <laughs> until the end of it remember it was it was one building yep. and then in two it escalated to be a slightly larger area of effect like mm-hmm. each movie was slightly larger in its area of effect yeah um and then we get like in three it was a couple blocks of manhattan 
And then finally, in, in like four escalates so that it's close to national and then five it's global right mm-hmm. and, and so i think by the time we get to four absolutely i think he would still be a detective because one he pisses everybody off who's higher up who would give him a promotion right and two the incidents were so isolated that i, I don't know that anybody outside of who it affected would have known who he was mm. But it's the same guy at each of them. Like, I, yeah, yes, only people in LA would have heard about Nakatomi, maybe. And it might have made, like, some of the newspapers around the world, around the country or something. Mm-hmm. But there would still be a thing on there, and and it was New York Cop who managed to stop them by working on the inside, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. But then a couple of years later, and the thing happens at Dulles and across DC, and it's the same cop who was involved and survives and helps stop them. Mm-hmm. And then the thing happens in New York. And it's the same guy again. Like, uh, he'd be up for security consultancy or consulting on action films. Or- I don't know. I mean, the FBI knew who he was. He's just a pain in their ass. Because he doesn't do things by the book. Mm-hmm. He doesn't follow the rules. And I don't think that you can get to that level that you're talking about unless you do those things. I, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure I'm talking about him getting a promotion within his job job necessarily it's the fact he they are still trying to portray him as kind of schlubby cop who just does the job and no one really knows him and so like like i said i think he'd be an american hero and he'd be a a celebrity because of doing all this stuff i think at this stage it's kind of you know the fact the bad guy is like not going wait mclean's the one who stopped those other terrorist things isn't he oh Perhaps we need to think about this. They have to go and look him up. They have to Google him to find out who he is. <laughs> right. Rather than, oh, yeah, I read about him because someone wrote a book about it. Because people would write books about him and about the events and okay, make movies about him. Like, you know, there's a movie about Sully and he's a guy who landed a plane. I mean, fair he landed enough. it on water, so fair enough. But <laughs> All right. All right. I'll give you that one. The, I think this one. is my thing. that the, the, the conceit they're trying to give is like... Yeah, it, it's just this cop who just gets involved in all these things and stuff. Like, mm-hmm. you know, show me some change and development in this world. Show me what the effect the last film has had on this film. Don't just make another action film where he gets involved in some massive plot to steal and make some money. Okay. That doesn't look like it's trying to steal and make some money. God, they they wrap themselves in wires, don't they, to try to deceive you that they're not just trying to make money off these plots anymore, do they? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> How many times was there a triple, double, quadruple cross in Die Hard 5? <laughs> oh my goodness. Mm. Yeah. Speaking of quadruple, double, whatever crosses in <laughs> Die Hard 5, if yeah, I yeah, have yeah. to come up with one thing that I like, I can come up with one thing in, okay. in the fifth one Good. that I like. Good, go on. Um, and it's a performance thing. Mm. Um, in the reveal, so we it got revealed that Yuri was actually behind the whole thing with him and his daughter. Like, he was never a victim. He has masterminded this whole plot. Yeah. And so now he's at Chernobyl getting all of his uranium out because, again, it's about the money. (laughs) Jack and John don't know this yet. They think this is a rescue mission for Yuri. Mm -hmm. They show up, and immediately Yuri reverts back into sickly, feeble, frail man who's been in prison for five years who's Mm -hmm. trying to be murdered right like instantaneously he you can see the physical transformation that he does Mm. it's not unlike christopher reeve's superman clark kent transformation that's a fair comparison yeah yeah Mm. and and that level of performance i enjoyed nice like the plot was crap the (laughs) Every, yeah, it, it was just a bad movie. It was all around bad movie, but that was one moment that I thought was really, really good. Right. Yeah. So, I, and I think the the it's the bit with the daughter earlier doing the double, triple, whatever cross. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Worked as well. I quite liked that thing. It's just she has to be in the short skirt that reveals her stockings, and she's wearing high heel, like. Uh, yeah. And flying off in a helicopter with her legs sticking out over the side. <laughs> yeah. It's just okay. It's like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was like that. That's not that. No, yeah. this is not a franchise that does women well. It does well. Okay, but oh. it did Lucy well. Lucy in four is absolutely John McLean's daughter. 
Yeah, in a toxic masculinity sort of way. Like saying to Justin Longard, grow a pair of balls and... Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Like, okay. Well, I mean, but... It, yes, she's, she's John, John McClane's McClane. kid. <laughs> because of that. And it's like, oh, come on. But she stood up for herself and, and she knew that her dad was going to save her. And she kind of, you know, she knew the information she needed to give him to make it at even the odds. Like when she said they're down only five. Yeah, I did. Like you know, that. like she she had a good head on her shoulders and she didn't panic. And yeah. I think she got that from him. Mm. Because I imagine he spent a lot of his life with her drilling into her. Here's what you do if a bad guy comes upon you. Yeah. Right? Probably with both kids. But we only get to see him be a terrible father to adult John Jr. And that's probably part of why she didn't really like her dad. Right. And, yeah. John Jr. has gone into a protection role mm-hmm. working to keep people safe and, and is clearly a action hero kind of guy. Yes. That's, that's he is not is. unlike his father. No. And I think the film wants us to go like, you know, he's a little too much like him. <sighs> Yeah, it was bad. What what happened to Jai Courtney? It feels like there was kind of there was Sam Worthington for a bit, and then there was Jai Courtney for a bit, and neither of them have ever actually really came to anything. I had to look him up. I don't know him from anything. Uh, I'm sure I'd seen him in something else, but he's just one of those guys. He was like he was in a series of action films for a period. Oh yes, he was in one of the Terminator films, and then he was in Suicide Squad. Oh, he was in Genesis, wasn't he? You know, yeah. Exactly. Genesis is the one that I haven't seen. Okay. Oh, and it's got, got a doctor in it. <laughs> Even Matt Smith has not made you watch the terrible Terminator films. <laughs> I was going to, and I just never got around to it. So That's fair. It's very fair, to be honest with you. Uh, good, good. Die hard. <laughs> All right. Is there anything else that we need to discuss about this franchise? So there are always rumors about a sixth film. There uh, are. Uh, Die Hard is one of those franchises. There are always rumors about it. Mm-hmm. And there always have been. I think I've seen something about like a sixth film that's just called McLean. Mm. That like is going down the Logan path or something, which. Uh... That's interesting. Because I, I think some of the stuff that I read, and again, because it's nothing's confirmed, mm-hmm. um, I've seen something about like a prequel prologue kind of thing. Isn't, isn't Die Hard the start of the story? How did John yep, McClane okay. become the guy who could keep his head in that situation? Mm. I don't know. Um, I do know Bruce Willis has said that he wants there to be a sixth film so that he can officially <laughs> retire the character of John McClane. I'm sure he does. <laughs> but I, I don't know. If it comes out, we're going to have to watch it. Oh, yeah. We're going to have to because mm. this podcast started with a Die Hard movie. Yeah. like We can't not do them if there are more. I mean, it's been seven years now since that last one. Yeah. So it is kind of time for it. Because mm-hmm. what have we got? Two years, five years, 12 years, six years. So yeah, they, they do come out a fair amount apart. And, and I would kind of be interested in a sixth film that maybe has him retiring, having gone into a job as a security consultant or, you know, right. done something differently so he can stay close to his family, you know, and something like that. And... Something happens across all of these that causes him to go on one last mission or Mm -hmm. something on those lines, you know? Yeah. Hmm. As recently as 2018, an updated script actually titled McLean was uh, submitted to the studio. Les Weissman is supposed to be on board to direct who did Mm four, but it has been removed from Fox's slate because of the Disney acquisition, so now it's going to be up to Disney to decide if... Oh, it's Fox, isn't it? Yeah. It was, yep, it's Fox. So, so it kind of depends on what they do with their adult franchises, mm-hmm. the, the Deadpools of this world. Yep. It looks like Tobey Maguire is supposed to be a part of it. Mary Elizabeth Winstead has said she would love to come back. Yeah, I welcome her in anything, so, you know. <laughs> yep. Yes, make a film around her, allowing her to do cool stuff. I would love to see that movie. Absolutely. I mean, she's Huntress, I think, in the new Birds of Prey Harlequin movie. Oh, is she? So, okay. I, I mean, not having seen it yet, so I don't know, but she's in that. Okay. Good. Cool. All right. Well, if you would like to join our conversation, you can use the hashtag PC Deprived on Twitter. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Eloquent Gushing, or you can send an email to podcast at eloquentgushing.com. 
As we said up top, thank you so much to Kate at Katie Sheru on Twitter for your wonderful support on Patreon. We love you very much. Thank you. If you want to do what Kate did, you can also support us on Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash gushing to help support us. You get early access to shows, exclusive content, exclusive merch, bonus things. Go and check it all out and help to support the network. And we will be back next week with another episode where we are going to talk about both parts of Twilight Breaking Dawn. Until next time, I am Mandy Kay. And you've got to be running out of bad guys by now. Pop Culturally Deprived is an Eloquent Gushing production. For more information, visit eloquentgushing.com or find us on Twitter at Eloquent Gushing.